Okay, everyone, I'm going to start on time because that's the right thing to do, and I want to value your time. Wow. Was Friday interesting? Um, it's, uh, it's something that I feel so passionate about that we need to constantly be communicating with one another. That is why I'm hosting this call. I want to prefer, uh, uh, kind of put this out there as far as what we're doing today in terms of this town hall and, and what this is all about, why we're here today. Um, and also let you know that there is about a 10 second delay uh, through YouTube. So just know that when we open this up to discussion, there's gonna be about a 10 minute, or excuse me, 10 second delay uh, between hearing the question and me responding. So just understand that part first. Um, thank you for joining. For those of you that do not know who I am, my name is Jason Mitchell, and I am the founder of JMG, which is the number one real estate team in the United States of America. Um, our business is very unique here at JMG. We service a lot of large organizations, and we're the largest B2B real estate brokerage in the country. We service around 100,000 plus referrals a year from large partnerships like Veterans United, Rocket Mortgage, Home Story, Zillow, the list goes on and on. Amerisave, you know, all, like we service a lot of partnerships, Mr. Cooper, Freedom Mortgage, you name it. So uh, the reality is with these relationships throughout the years, I've been fortunate enough to build some exceptional relationships with the CEOs and founders of these organizations. So for the past three days, I've been on the phone with many of them conceptualizing and talking about what the future may hold for our industry, not just with lending partners, but with search companies alike. And as I'm gathering information and trying not to be emotional like I was on Friday, I'm starting to come to conclusions on where I think this thing plays out. The reason I'm hosting this town hall and the reason I'm gonna be continuing to be an advocate in the face of what's happening is quite frankly, I owe our industry everything that I have in life. I've been in real estate for 22 years. It has been exceptionally good to me. And I feel this is a passion project of mine to just make our community aware of what's going on because now more than ever, we all need to stick together, period. And I'm gonna go deeper into that throughout this discussion. I'm gonna lead with two things. One, I'm gonna talk about facts and I'm gonna talk about what I believe. And then we're gonna open it up to some discussion points. But there's a lot to unpack with what's going on right now. And the reality is we need to stay together. So I'm gonna start with the history of what I know and what is factual and why we are here today. And what most importantly do we do tomorrow? That's the most important factor. So let's start with the history of NAR and the Seitzer Burnett case on how this all transpired and when that case was done where we are today. Let's talk about the past. About three, three years ago or so, with the Keller Williams NAR and Berkshire Hathaway really being the forefront of the lawsuit that occurred in Missouri, the real issue that the attorneys had call them tort attorneys, that they had was the universal compensation and buyers being unaware of transparency when it comes to a transaction. As this played out, what we realized and what they realized was there's some type of collusion going on where they were pointing to agent steering by a percentage of commissions and colluding with one another, meaning agents, that we're only showing properties that pay 3% or 4%, but not the twos and not the ones, and that's unfair to consumers. And so what happened was the attorneys <clears throat> for Keller and, um, and for Berkshire, uh, actually, hold on one second, there's a pop-up here. Um, the attorneys for Berkshire said, look, National Association of Realtors, just let them know that you'll change your rule to where a co-broke is optional, because this was the problem that the National Association of Realtors had. 
They used to say unequivocally, if you list a home in a local MLS, you must charge a fee. It can be a dollar, but you gotta charge something. And those said, well, that's not right. The attorneys, that's not right. You can't force somebody to pay. And NAR said, BS. You have to at least offer some compensation if you list a home in an MLS. So they said, look, this is the big part of the case. If you change your tune on this and you say, we'll make it negotiable, even though we all know our commissions are already negotiable, if they've always been negotiable, NAR said no, and we're gonna continue this fight. So as time went on and we go through the trial, if you noticed about two months before the verdict, NAR came out and said, you can put zero now, meaning you don't have to charge. Now they're saying you can't charge. And here's what happened. NAR says, okay, I'm staring at a five and a half billion dollar lawsuit. No one has that kind of money. So I can horse trade 400 and some million over four years and I'll just make it to where you're not allowed to charge a buyer broker commission within the listing, which is where all of this, in my opinion, is wrong. And it's the transparency of not knowing if a commission is being charged. Not for us as agents, for our buyers to not know that transparency. So if there was any collusion in the history of this case, it's that NAR, which is an association that we have to belong to in order to list a home on your local MLS, of which we pay two separate fees to, is dictating what you can put into your new listing come July. They're saying now you can't offer cooperative compensation, where before they said you must offer cooperative compensation. So there was some horse trading between them and the lawyers where they said, you give me a 90% haircut on fees and give me four years to pay it. We'll come out with this ruling. And this is where I think they threw everybody under the bus. And this is where the biggest point needs to come in of who this is hurting. It's hurting buyers. It's hurting buyers, especially the VA and FHA buyers that have no, none or very little down payment because they cannot afford buyer representation out of their own pocket. And if there's no cooperative compensation being offered, that's the position they're gonna find themselves into. So now what they've created is consumer steering. We're not steering you as agents away from properties. You're gonna steer yourself away from properties because you're gonna only wanna buy a home that is offering cooperative compensation because you are not gonna wanna pay representation fees, period. So now with the non-trans, this is, this is what I wouldn't have had a problem with. You want us to negotiate commissions in a contract? Fine, no problem. But you got to offer and let us know. You don't have to put a percentage. You don't have to put 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%. I don't care what you put as a percentage. But for transparency to the public, they need to know this because here will be the new world. The new world will be this. A client that you get connected with, like for example, one of our 800 agents that we have, if we give them a referral from one of our referral partners, they're gonna then say, looking forward to working with you. And then what happens is we all know, and this is why we don't steer. I made this argument the other day. I said, wait a minute. We as real estate professionals can't steer. Consumers find their own homes online and they say, I want to go look at this home and we show them that home. We don't steer. It's too transparent. Now, back in the 80s and 90s, yeah, I definitely can see how agents were steering back then because consumers didn't know what homes were available, what the commissions were. They knew none of that. That world doesn't exist today. We can't steer. It's too visible. So, now what's going to happen is, okay, think of this world. This is exactly what's going to happen. Your client's going to see a home on Zillow or Realtor. And they're going to say, hey, Jason, I'd like to see this house tomorrow. No problem. You call the listing agent. 
because you don't know if they're offering, offering cooperative compensation. Hey, we'd like to show your home tomorrow at two o'clock. By the way, are you offering cooperative compensation? No, we're not. Okay, then we have to pass. Click. And then we call our agent or client back and say, you know, that, that house, I can show it to you, but they're not offering cooperative compensation, which means you'll have to pay for my services out of pocket. Do you wish to do that? And they're going to say, no, I don't wish to do that. So clients and consumers are going to create their own steering. They're going to create their own steering from homes that they know that they don't want to come out of pocket for, which is ridiculous. You're now limiting buyers on home. It's already hard enough to buy a home. Now you're limiting them on product because they don't want to pay out of pocket. Not because they might not want to. No one wants to because they can't. They can't afford it. And someone said, well, they might not be able to afford 3%, but what about a point? How many of your clients have an extra five, six, seven thousand $7,000 that they can just cash out like? Most clients are limited to their down payment. And certainly VA and FHA borrowers, people that need home ownership the most, they don't have the extra money. VA zero down. How many veterans are getting crushed by this when this rule comes out? Because now you're only going to be able to limit veterans to buying homes that have cooperative compensation. No agent's going to work for free. And another thing that they screwed up is they don't, so, so what they're trying to do is they, they say, we're going to try to make it less affordable, or we're going to try to make it more affordable for consumers to buy houses. Well, tell me how that is. Because our system worked just fine. It comes from the net proceeds of a seller, which allows buyers to easily buy properties because the seller takes it from their net proceeds. That's easier for buyers to buy homes, not harder. You just made it harder. So now what they're going to create, follow me on this situation and follow me where this situation breaks. This is such BS. So now what happens is this. Now your client says, but I really like that home. I want to see it. I want to buy it. But I don't want to pay out of pocket. I'll just call the listing agent directly. Okay. So now the listing agent gets the call. But tell me this. In a dual agency situation, which no one really likes because of the risk, now with no chips on the table, no one will want to dually represent that client. Let me explain. In today's world and in the past, if you're listing a home at say 6% and I'm offering 3% to the buyer and 3% to the listing agent, and let's say somebody walks into the open house, okay? And they say, we really like it. Or let's just say you get a sign call. We really like this home, we wanna buy it. Okay, if you elect to represent that client, you now are assuming risk of dual agency. But at least there's a financial gain because there's monies to be made on the buyer side, which you might haircut your seller a point and only take two points, but at least there's financial compensation for the risk. What I used to do in the field was, because I've been sued twice in my real estate career, 22 years, both times I got sued, I was dually representing the buyer and the seller. So I decided back in 2013, I'll never do this again. So what I decided to do is, if I had a buyer that came to me and wanted to buy the home that I had the listing on, I would refer them to an agent friend of mine, have them represent the buyer, take the three points, and I would then take a referral fee from those three points because I didn't want the risk anymore of representing dual agency. But guess what? In the future, if there's no cooperative compensation, the listing agent, one, is not going to want to represent the buyer because they have no financial, they're getting paid 3% regardless. Why would I ever take on the risk of representing a new buyer when I have no financial benefit to do so? But what they also can't do is recommend to that buyer who went to the seller's agent directly because they didn't want to pay out of pocket for their buyer fees, that seller, that selling agent can't recommend a buyer's agent for them because there's no buyer broker commissions and they're certainly not going to give up a point to go send them to uh, a buyer's agent and have that taken from their own commission. They're automatically getting 3%. So dual agency doesn't even work in this new scenario anymore where people are saying, well, they will just go directly to the selling agent. The selling agent's not going to want dual agency. There's no financial gain. This doesn't work. And so this all comes down to it breaks 
because he has this, oh, I don't say he, he or she buyer has zero transparency of knowing what home they can buy and what home they can't. And now we're creating this underground world of contract negotiation via commission. Tell me how this scenario is better. We're gonna call because we're gonna have to negotiate through a contract our commissions. So we're gonna call a listing broker and say, are you offering cooperative compensation? And the listing broker is gonna say, yes. And you're gonna say, great, how much? And you know what the response is gonna be? It depends on your offer. So now, the more I offer, the more I can get paid. That's the way this underground world is gonna work through contract. How does that help the buyer? Well, if you offer, we're listed at 500,000. If you offer me 500,000, we can pay you 3%. But if you offer me 490, we can only pay you 1%. So now we're in a really bad spot of like, well, what do we do now? That's the underground world that they're creating. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. And it's all because of one simple fact that I hope we can change. Just make cooperative compensation transparent, so not for our purposes, for our buyer's purposes. They need to know the truth. They need to know if I can go see this home so I don't have to come out of pocket. So that's my thoughts. And the reality is, guys, I don't care what anybody says, this is the truth. NAR screwed us. They did. They hung us out to dry. And if you want collusion, why is it that I got to pay a fee here to join a board here and now you're going to dictate what I can do and can't do on a board? If my seller says offer 3%, why can't I tell people I'm offering 3%? Who are you to tell us? We're the ones that pay you the fees. You need to be listening to us. What's the point of NAR? They put us in this position in the first place, by the way, because if they weren't so arrogant four years ago when the other attorneys for, the, for Keller and Berkshire said, hey, look, just tell them it's negotiable. Who cares? It's actually negotiable as it is. We know that. Nope, we're not doing it. We're making them charge if they list a home. BS. Now you're saying we can't charge? Now you really screwed us over. And so here's where I think the future is, guys. Here's where I think the future is. This, to me was the dagger for the National Association of Realtors. And I also believe it's the dagger for local MLS. Because what ultimately needs to happen for everybody, including the consumers, which is the most important factor, what needs to happen is transparency. And also, I don't understand how every local MLS board, think about this, everybody, the local MLS board, okay, has the same end result, which is make a property transparent to the world. If you list on this MLS, all the aggregators grab the data so the whole world knows that this home's available, okay? Well, tell me this then. Why is it that every MLS charges different fees? Why is it in Manhattan, I gotta pay $5,000 a year to belong to that MLS, but here where I sit in Arizona, it's like 400 a year. Why is it in Atlanta, Georgia, they take 0.001 something percent, and in Seattle, Washington, it's per transaction. Why is it that all these local MLS boards have their own rules? Because it's these good old boy clubs that can charge whatever they want, however they want, and I also still have to pay to be a member of NAR to have them tell me these things. Why isn't there universal uh, fees. Why isn't the ability to list a home so easy? Why is it that there can't be just a national MLS that we all plug into for transparency and that we pay a certain dollar amount per year to use this national MLS? It's all done through these local jurisdictions, which are all in collusion with NAR. And I'm sorry if local boards hate me for saying that or NAR hates me for saying it, but the reality is I don't know what I don't know, but on the surface, guys, I couldn't, I couldn't say it more like the truth. That's certainly what it appears to be. So I think we get to a world where we have a better way of doing things. We have a better platform in the future, but we have to get there.
This is not going to work for buyers and consumers. Now, let's talk about what we can do as a community, because I never have felt more strongly that even with everything I just said, the only thing that can make or break what happens is us agents. And what I, what I mean by that is, NAR opened the door for weak agents to go into a listing appointment and say, hey, I'm only gonna charge you 3%. We're not gonna pay a buyer broker. And by the way, I'm not allowed to pay a buyer broker, which is false. We need cooperative compensation. Now more than ever, not just for us, not for us, for the buyers to have transparency but it allowed the ability for weak agents to take a listing and think they're saving their client money when in reality, they're not. But that's what this opened the door for. So if we take a stand as an agent community by encouraging when we go on a listing that offering cooperative compensation allows the ability for your home to be more favorable to more buyers in the market, not because of us agents, but because they will now be able to purchase your home because they won't want to pay out of pocket. And if they have to pay out of pocket, your home isn't as appealing to them. If agents take the stand of making sure that we all are in this together and encouraging cooperative compensation, then we'll be fine. But it's the weak agents, it's the weak agents that are gonna go to try to take a listing just to take a listing. But what they're really doing is, think of this, what they're really doing is they're screwing their seller over because they're gonna limit those opportunities for those sellers by not offering it. So number one, we have to encourage cooperative compensation at a high level. Again, in the best interest of the buyers and then the consumers. What we also need to do on the flip side with buyers and we're coming up internally, we're coming up with a couple different forms because we want transparency. But on the buy side, guys, this is what we gotta be doing. When you take an initial discussion that you have with a buyer, it's very important that you explain to them. In most cases, homes will offer cooperative compensation, in which case you will not have to pay for my services out of pocket. But in some cases, a home that you may like they may not offer cooperative compensation, in which case you may actually have to pay for my services out of pocket. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna give them the option, check yes, check no. Do you wish to only view properties that are offering cooperative compensation? And if they say yes, it's because the consumer chose that, not us steering. We don't steer, we can't steer. But now the consumer is telling us, only show me those properties that I know that I don't have to come out of pocket with. And that's the way it needs to be. And I would, I would have it in a document. And if they say, no, show me everything, no problem. But part of that disclosure is going to be, but just know, you may have to come out of pocket with services rendered. As long as the consumer has a choice, that's great. But the breaking point is the agent that goes on the listing to encourage their client to offer cooperative compensation. And I ask everybody on this call, first of all, I want to say thank you for joining this call. I mean, you all have families and careers to, to take 45 minutes, an hour today to join just my thoughts. And again, just remember this, I'm nobody. My thoughts are just my thoughts and they're just my opinions. A lot of this stuff is fact. But the reality is, is that I'm just trying to be a voice for our community and try to give as much information that I know so we can all be better together. That is my only purpose of doing this. And I wanna thank those that are joining this call because it's really important that we're all on the same page. It's really important that we all protect not just our industry, but our clients. And I asked this question, prior to this coming out, is there any agent on this call that if they went to a listing appointment and the client said, I'm not gonna offer a buyer broker any money, would you take that listing? The answer is, of course not. I would never take a listing that wasn't offering compensation because all I'm doing is setting my client up for failure, period. I'd never do that. And you know what? That doesn't change today. That doesn't change today. 
It's the same, it's just not transparent. We need to hope that there comes out, there, there needs transparency. We need to hope that we come out with something that has transparency, for sure, for our consumers. But in the meantime, if we stick with what we've always known, that cooperative compensation is good for all parties, we'll be fine. But we gotta stick together now more than ever as a community and for our consumers. And honestly, guys, especially for the little people, you know, especially for the VA, FHA, the low down payment borrowers, this is who it affects the most. The last thing I want to say is this. Because this is our career, because this is what we know and breathe and see every single day, let's not also lose sight of the fact of most people don't even know about this. And because most people don't know about this, it's important that we educate them, but also important that they understand too, most people with common sense, that you gotta pay for someone's services. So I think we're in a really good spot for the future on the sense of as long as we can get transparency, we're gonna be just fine. I have no problem negotiating commissions in a contract. My client would have no problem negotiating commissions in a contract. But you can't say that you can't offer compensation. That's ignorant. That destroys buyers. And I hope we get to that world. My other hope, my other hope is that nobody jumps the gun too much here because between now and July, there's going to be a lot of discussion on what we can do to improve the hammer that was just dropped. Meaning they dropped a hammer on Friday and has everybody freaking out. We all know that cannot be the way moving forward. That does, this, this does not work for the consumer at all. So hope so I believe that over the next 3 months there's going to be some better news that comes out. And just know this, cooperative compensation will always exist. No one could ever tell a seller you can't offer compensation for someone to buy your asset. It doesn't matter. Um I think we're going to be just fine. What I do think happens is I do think that we'll see some compression in the buy side arena. I do. But what that means is we just have to be more transactional. We have to service more. We have to find places and teams and brokerages that give us the ability to work with more consumers so we can be more transactional. We built our whole model on that at JMG, but this call isn't about JMG. This call is about understanding what's going on and how we can better our community. But we just will have to be more transactional. And I believe that we have ways to become more transactional in our industry moving forward. But we're going to find better legislation, legislative rules, and we're going to find more efficient platforms for us to do our business. Because I'll tell you right now, I don't care about NAR. I don't, I've never went on a listing appointment and had a client ask me, are you a member of the National Association of Realtors? That's never happened in my career. I don't think it's probably ever happened in yours. And these local MLS boards that are dictated by NAR, that's the collusion. So. I think that stuff's working its way out of the picture. I really do. There's a better way. In the meantime, we just wake up and we work hard and we are completely transparent and honest with our clients and we give them the full story because as long as they have the full story, they have all the information, that's all they need and we can do business. So that's my stance. And as I come and hear more information from some of our great partnerships um, and some of the heads of the table on this stuff, I'm going to make everybody aware of the truth, what's really happening. And then from what's really happening, what does that look like for the future? Because we all need to be on the cutting edge of what's happening. It's a massive shift. Anybody online that is saying, what's the big deal? They're wrong. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And we need to make sure that we're all together and collective on this as a community to make sure that our industry holds strong and to make sure that we're best representing the clients that we have moving forward. With that said, um, I think we got about 20 minutes for some open conversation. So I, we're at a little bit of a delay, so bear with me on that, but I would love to take some discussions uh, and some questions and some open form uh, if you guys would like to. Stay calm, carry on.
Yeah, sign buyer reps. So that's the key. And that that's important in, in transparency and disclosure. One, I'm not concerned about, like, I'll tell you this, guys. I love the fact that it's, I, I have said this for years. Everybody should have a buyer broker agreement signed. Everybody. Why? If I have my buyer broker agreement signed and I'm working with a client and I'm protecting myself, whether you're charging 3% for your services, hey, it's always been negotiable. Whatever you feel your service is worth is your buyer representation agreement. If I only get a point and a half in cooperative compensation, my client's making up the extra point and a half. But what I like and the reason we encourage buyer broker agreements is so if my client decides on Saturday to go to DR Horton and buy a home, I'm protected. We should always have these agreements. But here's what I like about that fact. I like the fact that as consumers start knowing they got to sign a representation agreement, you are now going to have more loyalty with your client than ever before. We should always have had that agreement. The problem was most agents didn't put a buyer broker agreement in front of their client because they felt it was intrusive. Now, when buyers start understanding that they have to sign this agreement, you as an agent, now as long as you do a good job, you're locking in your clients to more loyalty with you. And before that didn't happen. A lot of times we would tour and tour and tour and all of a sudden they go on the Zillow and find their own agent and you're out. That happens all the time. Or like I said, they go to a new construction community and you're out because you didn't have a buyer broker agreement signed. I love the fact that the buyer or broker agreement is gonna become common practice because now it makes your discussion easier with that consumer. Hey, I need this sign before I go and show you properties. It's a legal document and it's a must do. Okay, I guess I gotta sign this. Like, I love the fact that we're gonna be more tied into our buyer broker agreements. That is a wonderful thing for all of us. That's a great thing. So when the initial discussions for a while is gonna take people off guard, why do I have to sign this? Why do I have to sign this? But now we get to say it's a rule. And if they question that and they go to the next agent and the agent says the same thing, now they're gonna say, I guess it's a rule. So sooner than later, buyers are gonna understand, potential buyers are gonna understand, I gotta sign this agreement. And if you're the first agent that they speak with and you build good rapport with them, you're gonna have a lot of buyer broker agreements, meaning your pipeline of qualified buyers and more loyal buyers is gonna get much bigger. That's a great thing for us. The only reason we didn't say it in the past is you were afraid to say it in the past. Now you can't avoid it. That's a really good thing. If the client then go, okay, hold on, go to that question. Yeah, exactly. The VA, the VA borrower can't pay for commissions. That's why they're the ones getting screwed the most. Who's going to represent these poor people? If they want to buy this home and they have no cooperative compensation, they're going to be forced to have dual agency, which they're not going to want to represent dual agency because there's no buyer side compensation. That's where the VA buyer gets really screwed here because they can't do it even if they wanted to, they can't. What do you do with those people, guys? It's so reckless how they came up with this and so fast. Like all of a sudden in July, everything changes. You know how many contract docs need to change? In July? What? How? How? But the VA is the greatest point. What are they going to do? What did you just do to these people? It's bad. It's just reckless. What's another question? People saying the lawyers are not the best. All of this. Oh, yeah, lawyers. I mean, <laughs> the case was crazy. You mean to tell me that, that people selling their home didn't know that they were covering the cost of buyer broker commissions? Does anybody really believe that? Why do you think they held it in Missouri, a good old boy's city? Did you know the judge was related to the plaintiffs? From what I understand, at least, 
I heard the judge was related to somebody that was on the plaintiff's counsel. Did you know that they asked the jury that if you bought a home from, I think, 1994 forward, and you bought from Berkshire, Remax, Keller Williams, and they named a bunch of other groups that you had to recuse yourself from the jury? So, like, almost everybody got up, and the jury consisted of seven out of nine people, of which only two people owned a home? I was told through somebody I trust that was the main figurehead in this, some of the jurors were falling asleep. And they looked at they looked at the real estate industry as big business because the plaintiff's counsel did a great job of painting the picture that big business is screwing over consumers. Give the guy credit. Give the guy credit. He painted the picture that he needed to paint. But Michael didn't make the rule on NAR. The Department of Justice didn't make the rule. The Department of Justice said they're not a fan of universal compensation. That doesn't mean you can't say if you're offering something or not. That's why I'm pissed at NAR. I'm mad at NAR because you, you can't eliminate the transparency of saying if you're offering it or not. That's where the buyer gets hurt. All right. Yeah, super rushed is right. I mean, come on. And you know what? I don't know how that plays. There's so many legal dots. But you know, here's another thing, guys, and I get a kick out of this one. Think about this, everybody. You sue the real estate industry, attorneys. You sue the real estate industry over contracts that your industry drafted in the first place. What? We didn't draw up our contracts. Lawyers did. What? It's crazy. What is that? You can communicate the buyer composition on the website, flyers, et cetera, what problems is it solved? Yeah, so, you know, the transparency on your own website, you can do that. But the problem is, your clients are going to get their information from the main sites like Zillow, Realtor, Movado, Rocket Homes. You know, like the odds of them seeing the next home they want to see is going to be very small on your own website. And they're going to see a home and want to view it, but they're not going to offer cooperative compensation after you call the agent and they're going to be bummed out because they're like, well, what do I do? That's what this is leading to. That's the problem. So what we need to get is like a co-star or a Zillow or somebody to be able to claim your listing, like use the MLS as an aggregator for the time being. But then I go on to the site that everybody knows that we can see the transparency and I can claim my listing. And then they ask the question, are you offering cooperative compensation or not? And if you say yes, every agent will go to that site to, to make sure that there's cooperative compensation or not, or they'll direct their clients to use that site. See, it's all about the transparency to me. But that's where it breaks is the client's going to see their own home somewhere else and they're not going to know. Then they're going to want to see it. Then you're going to have to make a phone call to see if they're offering it. Then you're going to call your client back and say no. And they're going to say, well, what do I do now? A horrible buyer experience. Horrible buyer experience. How can title companies offer to complete contracts for buyers? They aren't agents. Um, yeah, no, I don't see title companies getting involved with this. And, and, you know, I keep hearing we're going to see these models to where the buy side becomes more transactional. <laughs> Listen to this. Tell me, tell me if this would ever work. Okay. Transactional means service oriented. We'll get paid by our services like lawyers, CPAs. Any asset that gets sold is based on percentage. High-end art, commercial real estate, it's all based on the percentage of the asset, not time spent. But for example, imagine this world. Imagine this. Like For those of you that work with attorneys or have attorneys, I don't know about you, but every time I get my bill for my attorney, I look at that bill and I say, how in the world did you work on that case or that problem for so long? How did that cost me 10 grand? Do they share their log with you? No. Do you know when they're working? No. Check this out. 
if real estate becomes a place where we become hourly contractors, what it, the client's going to have the same problem. So all of it, think about representing a buyer. I got to <laughs> check the, I send you a bill. Yeah, I looked at properties for you for three hours last night. You did? Yep, sure did. Spent three hours looking at properties for you, trying to find you the best one. You don't think they're going to have a problem with real estate agents stating stuff like, I've been looking at properties for you. Our conversation on Monday, I had to charge you for. My drive time here, I had to charge you for. And then all of a sudden, you start adding up the hours that we actually spend representing a buyer. And it actually becomes more money than the co-broke that was offered in the first place. How are they going to pay that bill? That ain't going to work. Or they say, represent by the transaction, maybe charge a point. They still don't have the money to come up with a point, number one. They don't want to. But even if it's a point, let me ask you this question. A point for what service? I'll draft a contract for a point and submit it for you and negotiate for a point. But I'm not touring you five times, missing out on three offers, finally getting the fourth one accepted, have it fall out for appraisal, then find you another one when we go on tour again, finally get you under contract, have inspection issues. You think I'm doing all that work for a point? No, I don't think so. That's why the sale of the asset is important because the consumers, the consumers protected because there is no unknown. Today's world, they don't have to worry about any of that. It's easier to buy a home today than it is in the future of what they're proposing potentially. That's ridiculous. Services at an hourly rate? Good luck with that. I send a, so what do I do? Send a final bill to a title company? and it's nine grand, do they have nine grand? No, okay, then that, that possibility's out. Flat fee, okay, but what services am I providing? Because when you think about it, a two and a half percent co-broke for the amount of hours that you spend with buyers is super fair. If you're buying a $400,000 home and I make $10,000, but it cost, but I had to spend 30 hours with you, what's the hourly rate? Fair. You would argue that the real estate's profession, residential real estate, is probably the cheapest asset class of purchase on a commission standpoint. High-end art, you got to pay Christie's, a buyer broker premium, 10 to 12 percent. Commercial real estate, 7 to 8 percent. Residential real estate averages 5.2 percent for both sides. It's about as cheap as it can get. The amount of time a buyer's agent spends with a client or a listing agent spends going to the house, showing it time and time again, providing feedback, marketing services, print, videos, all that other stuff, you don't think two and a half percent is fair? Are you crazy? It's more than fair. So that world won't work. We can't become a service fee because the services rendered is going to be more than the services of a two and a half percent co-broke. It's crazy. Again, this all goes back to if we stay strong and encourage cooperative compensation, everything will play itself out. It's the weak agents that think they're doing themselves a service to just get a listing that think they're going to win and they're going to shoot themselves in the foot. Why has my home been sitting for 150 days? Well, I could have had about 40 more showings, but uh, they didn't want to show it because their buyers didn't want to pay out of pocket. Oh, that's BS. That's BS. I guess we'll offer cooperative compensation then. Yeah, you should have offered it in the first place. Sorry if I'm passionate about this too. Like I get emotion, but like I'm 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 upset about this. And I'm upset about this because it's the industry of that we have and that we've all built our life on. But you're devastating the consumers and it pisses me off. That's why I'm so emotional about this because they changed something that was unnecessary to be changed and it's causing hurt and will cause hurt if they don't figure out a better solution to this to buyers and sellers alike. Dave Balzerzak, that's my old boss. How about that? Home builders typically pay, scroll down, what did Dave say? Home builders typically pay 
the commission agents and clients should have more peace of mind showing. What does that read? I can't read it. Uh, mind showing new construction floor. Well, I'll tell you what. So Dave was my boss's boss, by the way, when I worked at Pulte Homes. That's how I started my career. And I will tell you that I had a great career at Pulte Homes and I had, I had the best experience working there. I worked there for five years and Dave was a great boss. Uh, the reality of new construction, yes. And if you notice the stock prices, let me touch on two things. New construction is going to do fine in this because they're going to offer cooperative compensation. They're no different than any other seller. But now what agents are going to do is recommend new construction, not for the best interest of their own pocket. They're going to represent new construction for the best interest of the buyer that doesn't have to come out of pocket. But if you look at stock prices, EXP, Compass, they're down what, 20% since Friday? They've already been down 70%. And I, and I warn everybody on this, I warn everybody on this truly, and this isn't a play. And by the way, Gary Keller, I'm exceptionally close with Mr. Keller on a very personal level. Level, I love Glenn Sanford. He's a pioneer. Both of those guys are pioneers. I don't know how much those two don't get along, but the reality is, is these are smart leaders. But the other reality is this, Compass lost hundreds of millions of dollars over the past few years. In fact, I think it's like $500 million over the past two years, Revkin's group. We are going to get compressed on commission. How are these companies going to survive? The only way these big broker shops survive is they're going to have to charge their agents more. So agents are going to get charged more, but yet make less. That's a tough proposition because they're going to have to charge more, guys. They're barely, they're barely cutting it now. And when margins get compressed, that's why you're seeing the stocks act like they do because at some point, if they're making 70 to 80 less basis points a transaction, what do they do? The only way to make up revenue is you've got to somehow charge an agent. You have to. So whether that's in fees, a higher cap, but mark my word, I don't know which ones are going to do it, but I'll bet you most do because once one does it, the other will follow suit, but they're going to have to charge you guys more money. That's why I like humbly say from a, a transactional standpoint to be more transactional you got to find places that you can be more transactional. And I'm not saying JMG is the answer. This is not, I don't care about, I don't give a shit about that right now. I'm just saying you got to find, you got to find the right brokerages or teams that can help you be more transactional because you got to be more transactional in the future. That's a given. But I do believe a lot of these brokers are going to left with no choice, no choice, but to charge more to their agents just for them to stay afloat in a lot of cases. What's that question? Will sellers? Will sellers say collusion if we say the property? No, no, no. And it's also how you pitch that. It's, it's just tell them the facts. The fact is, is that if we don't offer cooperative compensation, it's not about the agents not being willing to show your home. It's their, their clients are not going to want to see it because they're not going to want to have to pay for services. And if you're not offering cooperative compensation, they're going to find themselves where they have to they have to pay their representative out of pocket and they're just going to say pass on that house. I also put to you guys that think about today. This is why I still think we're in a good spot. As long as you give the buyer's agent choice. Think about how many clients you meet that say you may have to pay out of pocket if I find a home that you like that they're not offering cooperate cooperation compensation, cooperative compensation, excuse me. Or you can elect to just see homes that are offering it and you don't have to worry about it. I'll bet you eight out of 10 people say, just show me houses that I don't got to pay out of pocket. And here's the other interesting point. We're moving into more inventory and that's going to continue to happen. As rates will start to tick down, inventory will open up because sellers will now be willing to sell because they can trade their three and a half percent interest rate for maybe a five and a half. The reality is inventories will open up. So if inventories open up, homes will sit longer. We're gonna have much more willing participants on the seller side knowing that they gotta pay cooperative compensation to move their home. The open market will dictate that on its own. And the buyer behavior will dictate the sellers now understanding cooperative compensation needs to be offered because the buyers aren't gonna to wanna to see my house. But we as a community need to be having these discussions, guys. Let's do one more question.
Oh, will you put in my Instagram so people can follow me on IG? $333 an hour, that's pretty good money. Yeah. What do you what do you think attorneys charge? Five hundred an hour, six hundred an hour? I mean, my my DC is attorneys are eleven hundred an hour. My local attorneys four seventy five an hour. We're licensed professionals. You think our services are fifty bucks an hour? I pay most of my staff fifty bucks an hour. Like. $300 an hour for our professional services is quite cheap. What's that say? Big, big bad DMS? Big bad DMS. $300 an hour for professional services is quite fair. Some lawyers charging like $600. Oh, yeah. Lawyers charge. I mean, the minimum attorney is $450 bucks now. I mean, now you can get their paralegal for $250, but. 300 bucks an hour for professional services is nothing. And if you say 700,000, if you had a regular job, the reality is, yeah, at $50 an hour, we're not charging our clients or at 50 hours a week. We're not all working 50 hours a week with a client working on it, just like attorneys aren't. So like, that, that's not true. $300 for professional services rendered would be a smoking deal. All right, scroll down. Please put that. Can you not type that? Oh, there you go. Follow me on IG. It's at Jason Mitchell underscore JMG. I'm going to keep everything up to date. And, um, and again, guys, all I'm doing here is I want to create awareness to our community. It's important. I want to hear your feedback. I want to know what you're hearing out there. But now more than ever, we need to stick together for ourselves and for our consumers. That's without question. And as this thing unfolds and untangles, I'm going to host more of these. I hope I know I was I know I have emotion and I'm passionate but again at the same time like this is about our future like I told my staff I spent my whole life building this company and you have spent a lot of your life in real estate this is critically important so let's stay close and um and I think we'll come out on top but we need to be together and we need, we need to be preaching the message of empowering our sellers the understanding that it is important to offer cooperative compensation, and we should be encouraging that at every step of the way. I appreciate you guys very, very much. Thank you for your time.